Good morning. House Democrats consistently articulated the position that we needed to reopen the government so then we can have a mature conversation about border security. The government, after a 35-day reckless shutdown, was reopened. <clears throat> a conference committee was appointed. And Democrats and Republicans have now come together on a bipartisan agreement to move us forward. The American people expect that when there is divided government, Democrats and Republicans, the left and the right, progressives and conservatives will come together to try and find common ground in the best interests of the American people. The agreement that has been reached by the conference committee represents 21st century border security, which will improve the safety and well-being of the situation along the border, including as it relates to those who are seeking asylum in the United States of America. The agreement that has been reached includes many Democratic priorities as it relates to investment in infrastructure, investment in technology, investment in additional personnel where needed. We expect that the House will vote on this legislation at some point tomorrow afternoon or thereafter. Of course, we have the funeral services for John Dingell in the morning and for Walter Jones, who has passed the distinguished gentleman from North Carolina in the afternoon. With that, uh, let me yield to our Vice Chair, Catherine Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to all of you. Uh, while the President may be content holding the government hostage, Democrats are moving forward and focusing on the challenges that are on the top of the mind of American families. Uh, Democrats are focused and hard at work on our For the People agenda. Just last week, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee held a comprehensive hearing on investing in roads, bridges, mass transit, ports, airports, schools, water systems, and energy grids. Just yesterday, my colleague Rosa DeLora introduced the Family Act, which would provide 12 weeks of family leave protection for workers who take leave. And the Natural Resources Committee has had three climate change hearings just this week. One happening right now is the impact of climate on tribal communities. For the first time, Deb Holland, a congresswoman from New Mexico, will be presenting the tribal perspective as a member of that committee. Today, House Judiciary Committee is marking up H.R. 8 and the background check bill. This has the support of 97% of Americans across political ideologies. And tomorrow, we will honor the one-year anniversary of the mass shootings in Parkland, Florida. 14 students and three staff members were killed. And today, we will lose 100 Americans to gun violence, as we do each and every day in this country. A 2017 study found that 22% of gun owners who purchased a firearm in the past two years did so without a background check. We can do better in this country we can address the gun violence epidemic that we have. And these are the issues that we are moving forward with as a caucus. 
to represent uh, some of our new members. We are very excited uh, to have Dean Phillips from Minnesota join the caucus today. And we are also excited that he is not still in a deep freeze in Minnesota, but is thought out and ready to be here with us. Thank you, Thanks, Dean. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am one of 90 uh, new members of uh, the U.S. Congress freshman class, uh, most of whom on both sides of the aisle ran because we think we can do better. Uh, we're appalled at the lack of process and regular order, uh, and we collectively are bringing a new spirit, we hope, uh, to a place that could use a little bit more of it. Uh, most of our 45-day tenure so far has been spent under a shutdown, uh, and it bothers us deeply. In fact, on a bipartisan basis, we've had many conversations about ending these forever. We think it should be removed from the political toolbox uh, in perpetuity. Uh, we're very like-minded uh, in that. I also want to remind everybody that Democrats believe in border security. We also believe that it should be based on fact, driven then by a strategy and then resourced appropriately. Uh, we hope in the future that we can bring process back to a place that surely requires it. Uh, we've also, I, I can tell you, we're a class that has been listening for the last two years while campaigning and now even in Congress. Uh, and we want to bring that spirit back here, and that's what's driving our Democratic agenda, uh, starting with H.R. 1, uh, which we believe to be foundational, not just a statement of principle, but foundational if we hope to achieve things for this country in this wonderful House of Representatives. Uh, ending corruption, the culture of corruption, bringing ethics back to a place that needs it, and perhaps most importantly, reforming our very broken campaign finance system. By so doing, then we can turn our attention uh, to the most important issues facing this country, the ones that we listen to every single day. I'm so honored and grateful to be part of this class, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Questions? Mr. Chairman, a couple weeks ago, you told us that you thought you could get behind rebuilding some of these existing structures along the southern border, uh, but this has 55 miles of new, new uh, physical barriers in new geographic areas. Is this something that you can sell to your caucus, and do you think that a, a majority of your caucus is going to vote yes on this? It appears to me, based on the conversation that we had today, uh, that the overwhelming majority of the House Democratic Caucus uh, will support uh, this legislation that will be presented on the House floor tomorrow. Democrats control the House. Republicans control the Senate. Donald Trump is the president. This legislation is a product of trying to find common ground. We made clear from the beginning that we would not support funding for a medieval border wall that would be built from sea to shining sea. We also indicated that we were prepared to support evidence-based barriers where necessary. The conference committee has come together and concluded uh, that it is reasonable to support 55 miles of additional barrier in a manner that is consistent with our evidence-based approach to find common ground and improve the security along our border. Are you worried about the section from the CPC and the CHC, folks who say that there shouldn't be even one penny for new, new barriers? Uh, Speaker Pelosi, from the very beginning, has done a tremendous job uh, in moving the caucus forward, and in the particular instance of who she appointed to the conference committee, it reflected the wide range and diversity, both racially, ethnically, in terms of gender, region, as well as ideological diversity on the conference committee. Conference committee included everyone from one of our most conservative members, Henry Cuellar, to one of our most liberal and progressive members, Barbara Lee, and all points in between. They have put this forward to the caucus together uh, with one unified voice. I expect that there will be strong support in all of the ideological quarters of the House Democratic Caucus with respect to this legislation. to limit the number of ice beds, and the average daily population under this agreement would be higher than the current average daily population that's funded. You know, how do you defend that change, that just life and divided government? It's important to look at the totality of the agreement, and had a continuing resolution been passed before the president recklessly shut down the government on 
December 21st, then funding for additional barriers would have been at $1.6 billion. This agreement limits the funding for additional barriers to $1.375 billion. At the end of the day, when you're trying to find common ground, compromise is necessary, and that is the case as it relates to the bed situation. Um, there was a lot of controversy this week around Congress, Congresswoman Omar, and I want to sort of set aside that, but some groups, including some Jewish groups, say that she is forcing a broader conversation about American policy toward Israel and the plight of Palestinians. And I want to ask, do you think that that conversation is necessary? The overwhelming majority of the House Democratic Caucus is strongly pro-Israel and will continue to be so into the future. But is the conversation necessary? Conversations on foreign policy and domestic policy matters are critically important. We continue to have those conversations both at the committee level as well as at the caucus level as needed. I'll take that as a no comment. Um, quick change of gears here. The expansion on uh, background checks on, uh, on uh, firearms. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, how, A, is that going to be enforced as far as the way Democrats see it? And, and number two, how does that not essentially force some, some type of registration in, in the future? I believe it's 97% of the American people, including the overwhelming majority of gun owners support the notion uh, that we should have universal background checks. As you know, the legislation, if you look at the four corners of it, does not require registration. That explicitly is the case. This is a bill that will expand criminal background checks to close the gun show loophole and close the internet sale loophole, period, full stop. What we've seen since 1994 is that three million people under our current background check system, dangerous people, have been stopped from purchasing a gun. And this bill will have the same enforcement that we have under our current system, but as the chairman said, be able to close loopholes that currently exist. That is why there is such uh, uniform support from all sectors of the American population, because we understand the value of keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people. So it will be the same system, same enforcement, but take in some of the areas around the internet, gun show loopholes, and also address what we call the Charleston loophole, which, which allowed um, a gun to be, uh, to be obtained by the shooter in that horrible church massacre because he did not get his background check in within three days. It will extend it to a 10-day period, and then they will be able to reapply. But we see this as something that is demanded. We saw it coming out of the midterms, and it is a common-sense bipartisan proposal going forward. That, that basically no registration whatsoever is going to be required on a federal level as far as these expansion of background checks on private sales and transfers. I mean, that's what it is as far as this gun show loophole of what you're describing, correct? I'm not quite sure I understand your question, but to get to the original premise, the Department of Justice and the FBI will have primary responsibility for enforcing the requirements that we hope will be enacted into law consistent with the values of the overwhelming majority of the American people. This is a discussion that we should be having in the United States Congress as it relates to the gun violence epidemic in the United States of America, particularly on the eve of the tragedy that took place in Parkland. Uh, the president shut down the government in December because he didn't get the requested five billion for the wall. He's ending with 1.375 billion. Do, do you view this as a straight up win for the Democrats and a loss for him? This is a win for the American people because they expect Democrats and Republicans to come together to solve problems. The American people do not expect that government will be recklessly shut down because of a policy dispute between the executive branch and Congress. The reckless shutdown was ended, 
we've now come together. Democrats and Republicans have worked out a bipartisan compromise piece of legislation. That's a good thing for the republic. That's a good thing for our democracy. That's a good thing for the American people. But do you think he lost the battle of the border? Uh, Mr. Jeffries, last, uh, last week, some of your more progressive colleagues put forth their Green New Deal proposal, and then you saw some of your more moderate colleagues get attacked based on that proposal by Republicans and others. Do you have, what's your message to, to your colleagues who are putting forth these, these very aggressive proposals that are uh, proving to be very politically divisive? Do they need to be careful about uh, putting their fellow Democrats in an uh, uncomfortable place politically? Well, we embrace robust ideological discussion with respect to issues of importance to the American people. Climate change is an issue of importance to the American people. The United States military recognizes climate change as one of the top national security threats to the nation. The Green New Deal is a addition to that discussion. It's important for us to flesh out all of the ideas that have been presented. I expect that the Select Committee on Climate Change will weigh all of the alternatives that are available in terms of how we deal with climate change and then recommend to the Energy and Commerce Committee as well as the House Democratic Caucus how we should move forward. Is it unhelpful to be talking about eliminating air travel and cows and things like that? I haven't actually been able to review the specifics of the resolution and it's my understanding that there's some dispute as to what's in the resolution, what's in some background documents, and so until I get some clarity, uh, it's best that I don't answer further. Um, House Democrats, when you guys were in the minority, you made a big stink about Republicans rushing bills to the floor. You passed a rule earlier this year to require 72 hours between filing bill and voting on it. Yet, as we wait for the Texas agreement, it sounds like the vote will be called within 24 hours of the text being available. Can you justify that? And why not just do a short term, another week, two week CR to give people time to draft the bill, read the bill before voting on it? Well, th there was an agreement that was reached that we would try to find common ground in advance of February 15th. After surviving a 35 day government shutdown that put 800,000 federal workers, plus their families, plus the American people, plus the economy in harm's way. The right thing to do at this moment is to come together and consider this bipartisan agreement. The spirit of the rules are designed to make sure that all 435 members of the United States House have an opportunity to participate meaningfully in the legislative process. In the context of the conference committee, there were Republicans and Democrats represented on that conference committee, both of whom regularly reported back uh, to our respective conferences on the progress that has been made. Uh, and we trust and expect that members are sufficiently briefed in the context of this particular narrow circumstance where we're trying to avoid another government shutdown. I, I would just like to add that we do not want to put um, process over people in such an unusual and uh, crisis situation. We have new numbers back that 67% oh, of federal employees affected by the shutdown either spent all or a large portion of their personal savings. I can tell you from talking to employees um, and families in my district, the concern, the anxiety is very real. This took an $11 billion um, uh, out of our economy, $11 billion, $3 billion of which is permanently gone. We have to be able to be flexible and realize what we have here is a crisis and an emergency and a shutdown cannot be allowed to happen again. And we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that we do not let this president um, hold our federal employees and economy hostage again and that we get this compromise bill to the floor and voted on before Friday's deadline. Yeah, Cheryl, I, I want to come back to your question about uh, Representative Omar because I think the answer transcends and answers a lot of the questions asked today. Uh, I spoke with her uh, before I issued a statement because I think uh, that's what we should do before condemning anybody or their uh, perspectives or statements. And we had a frank discussion, an impassioned discussion. 
Uh, and in my statement, I said it's time that we all start talking more and tweeting less, because whether it's the shutdown, uh, whether it's anti-Semitism, uh, most misunderstandings uh, tend to happen because of a unilateral approach. And uh, I talk about this freshman class. Uh, we are collaborators. We are collegial on both sides of the aisle. We are trying to inspire conversation, uh, bring that back, because that is what this is supposed to be about. Uh, and that is my hope uh, of the, some of the change we bring. I think it will prevent a lot of the circumstances we find ourselves in right now. Uh, that's the spirit of this party, this caucus right now. Uh, and my hope is it transcends this entire, uh, entire chamber. And, and I just want to add that I also hope that this conversation is not limited to the Democratic caucus. We are still waiting for the apology from uh, Kevin McCarthy for his tweets that were the same anti-Semitic tropes uh, that we saw this past week. H.R. 1 would legally require the president and vice president to release for tax returns. Should House Speaker Pelosi be required to release her tax returns, yes or no? Well, that's a question that I think you should direct to Speaker Pelosi. Uh, <clears throat> on a different topic, there's momentum building in the Senate for among Republicans to rein in some of the authority the president has on trade related to national security purposes. Um, and they're debating whether they should have a approval or disapproval resolution in the Congress on future measures. Would they find a partner in House, House Democrats on that? Well, the trade issue is of particular importance to many members of the House Democratic Caucus, and we believe uh, in fair trade and in better negotiated deals that serve the best interests of the American middle class and all those who aspire to be part of it. In terms of the particular vehicle, I think we're open to discussion as it relates to what the other House of Congress does, uh, but we'll make some decisions on our own in terms of what procedurally makes sense to accomplish the su substantive objective, which is to continue consistent with our For the People agenda to stand for working families, middle class folks, senior citizens, the poor, the sick, and the afflicted. Congressman, uh, you mentioned the Green New Deal earlier. I was wondering if you could um, speak a little about why you personally did not sign on to it and what your own perspective <coughs> is on the resolution. Yeah, as chair of the House Democratic Caucus, my view is that when there are issues subject to robust debate within the many members uh, of the House Democratic Caucus, that it's best that I don't weigh in until I have an opportunity to evaluate the particular legislative proposal and have a discussion with all of the interested parties. Already hearing some early concerns from some of your colleagues who live on the border and therefore are most intimately affected by the 55 miles of barrier or fence or whatever you want to call it. They're happy to show you pictures of it and they say this is in fact a medieval wall, the thing that you had warned against. What do you say in response to those concerns by those who live in those communities? Well, I'm going to defer to uh, Catherine Clark, but I think what we have consistently opposed is the notion that we should waste $5.7 billion on a medieval border wall that's a fifth century solution to a 21st century problem. We were not going to allow this administration or any administration, Democrat or Republican, to build a wall from sea to shining sea that would be ineffective as it relates to border security. I believe that this bipartisan negotiated agreement accomplishes that objective. I can tell you what I've been hearing from the conferees is that this proposal will be 45 miles of potential new fencing and 10 miles of levees, potentially, and that the conferees are still working on the details, but it goes down to as much as mile per mile. Where is the need? Why is this needed? What is the priority for a particular fence in a particular area? Um, the, the wildlife areas, other preserves um, are, are, are carved out and protected. Uh, we just saw, you know, last week indications that there was some activity at a wildlife um, butterfly preserve down on the Texas border. That has been protected, um, and that is what the conferees are pushing for. So we will continue to take uh, the input of our tremendous members of our Congress who actually live 
in these border communities live this every day. This is what their constituents experience. We want to be very clear about this has to be data driven and it has to be what we're hearing is in the best interests of national security. So we are confident that this agreement, which is always a compromise, not something that Democrats would have written on their own, really has dealt with those essential protections and is going to be data driven in, in high need areas that are unaddressed at the moment. Can I follow up on that? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Democrats, are you guys gearing up for another fight? Because the president says he's going to take another stab and look for money in other places, maybe reprogram funding. And does this also, does this agreement set a precedent when you guys have to renegotiate after this fiscal year ends? Do you think that now the, the baseline is going to be close to $1.4 billion each fiscal year for the president's wall? We don't need gamesmanship. We don't need petulance. We don't need misbehavior from this president of the United States. What we need is leadership. And at the end of the day, this has been a bipartisan negotiated agreement with Democrats and Republicans to come together to enhance our border security. Beyond that, we'll see what the president does but I'm hopeful that he will sign this into law. What about some of the other items that might be part of this deal? Can you tell us whether back pay for federal contractors, tax extenders, any of those things might be part of this broader agreement? Well, there are some things that we were briefed on earlier today that are part of the broader agreement that I think have strong support amongst the House Democratic Caucus, in particular an additional $500 million for Section 8 housing, affordable housing in this country is increasingly a challenge and we need the federal government to step up and do more. That's been negotiated and signed off on as part of this agreement. We also uh, were briefed on the fact that there will be an additional $1 billion for the census uh, to do the type of outreach necessary to make sure that every single person in this country is counted and participates in that constitutionally required effort. I'm sorry. I promise I'll go here and then there. Thank you. Um, I am curious um, how you see sort of this prolonged fight and negotiation over the border as setting the tone for things that you and the White House have both said you want to work on, like lowering prescription drug costs and, and infrastructure. Do you think that the White House actually does want to work with House Democrats in good faith on these issues? It's important to take the president at his word. He came before Congress and delivered his State of the Union to the nation and said that we need to work together to drive down the high cost of prescription drugs and work on fixing our crumbling infrastructure. We believe as House Democrats that it's time to give the federal government through Medicare the ability to use its bulk price purchasing power to negotiate lower drug prices on behalf of the American people. We believe as House Democrats that it's time to invest at least a trillion dollars to fix our crumbling bridges, roads, tunnels, airports, and mass transportation system in a manner that we think will create 16 million good paying jobs over a five year period of time. Those two areas are potential places where we can find bipartisan agreement if we get presidential leadership. Yeah. You know, and, and I remind everybody that the President of the United States ran on draining the swamp and the first bill that we I hope to entertain in our agenda is H.R. 1, which is exactly designed to do just that. So if you ask about intersections, I can assure you that there's a great deal of appetite in this caucus to work together on that. Uh, you talked about the environmental impact of the wall, yet we hear very little about the environmental impact of the illegal immigration border crossings. I mean, the uh, Arizona Department of uh, Environmental Quality estimates that over 2,000 tons of trash are discarded at the Arizona border every year. And we hear very little coming from the caucus about the environmental impact of illegal border crossings. Can you address that? What we have here in, in, in this Homeland Security, what we're seeing from our caucus are the values of first border security and how, how we are going to go forward on that in a way that makes sense and uses our money as wisely as possible. Second, on how the need for broad immigration reform 
continues to be underscored. And how we deal with refugees coming into this country, how we keep our ports secure, these are all fundamental to the values that this caucus is working on. And at the same time, for the first time, we are putting climate change, environmental considerations, including litter, um, on the front burner of, of this uh, caucus and of the House of Representatives. Those are the issues that we are focused on. Those are the issues around immigration and climate change and protecting our environment, that this caucus is unified and we are making progress that we frankly just haven't seen under Republican leadership and will continue to do so. Next question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, it's some of it.